Good morning. Uh, the uh, Camino Road is reconvening. It's 934. Good morning, Mr. Sheehan. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? A little nervous, <laughs> but otherwise good. Good. Uh, would you please state your full name and your Department of Corrections ID? John Anthony Sheehan. 11-61-99. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, yeah, let me pull up your records. Technology is working very slow this morning. Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Sheehan, uh, my name is Alvin Roche. Uh, to my left is Mr. Anthony Marabella, and to my right is Ms. Mrs. Watts. We will propose your panel this morning. Uh, I'm a little familiar with the, with the uh, process, but I will explain it for those who are in the room for the first time. I will read some information into the record. Once that information is in the record, we will conduct a thorough interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will give one Falcon or one Ambo a chance to make comments and logs and observations. And, and we have a variety of participants and opposition uh, in the hearing room. We have Mr. A, uh, Timothy Ryan Sr., a friend of the victims, Ms. Tina Ryan, a friend of the victims, and Ms. Julia uh, McDowell, the mother of the victims. All those individuals would like to make a statement. Uh, Ms. Nordyke, would you uh, introduce yourself and your name in the record as turning for the offender. Yes, sir. Uh, Keith Nordyke appearing on behalf of John Sheehan. And Mr. Roche, I would note that there are two speakers that have been trying to get into the hearing since 7.15 this morning. One is uh, retired warden Wayne Cook, who literally called me as you were addressing me for the second or third time today. Um, and he's been trying to log on to the, the standard Zoom call. And I know that also a retired warden, uh, Daryl Vinoy, is going to be attempting to speak. So I'm, I'm a little concerned that the speakers have not been, uh, been able to get in, particularly Warden Cook. But I am here representing Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, do we have a cook on the list? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, okay. I did the registration this morning. I didn't see any of those things. I don't know if they have any correct meeting yet. But I didn't see any of those things. Uh, what, you, what you did, Mr. Nardyke, we're going to give you the a meeting ID. And would you transfer that to one cook? If, if, it is, if it is the same one I use, I will go ahead and just give call him right this second and give it to him. Okay, and, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And, and when he's logged on, we will recognize him. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also have in support Mr. Nicholas Gillery, the brother who would like to speak. Uh, Ms. Deborah che Chehan, who is white. Donovan uh, Underwood, their father. Oh, so sorry. Oh, yes. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. Step sons. And we also have Mr. Karen Myers of the Louisiana Parole Project that would like to speak. So speaking uh, for the, uh, Mr. Sheehan, his attorney, his brother, and Karen Myers. After all those statements are made, before we vote, we will give you an opportunity to make a statement on your behalf. And then your attorney, Mr. Nardyke, will close out the hearing. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. 
This is Shea, your DLC number is 169199. Uh, you're currently 58 years old. Your first felony offender. Your offense is uh, second degree murder. And you were originally uh, sentenced in 1988, but just recently, your sentence is commuted by Governor John Bell Edwards. And you I have been sentenced of 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. And that was done on the 16th of November, 2022. Your new adjusted parole eligibility date is November 16th, 2022. Your adjusted good time date, May 23rd, 2035. And your full term date, November, 17, 2085. Is all that information correct? Yes, sir. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Marabella. Would you please answer Mr. Marabella's question? Good morning, Mr. Yes. Sheehan. How are you today? Better, sir. I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, you're 58 years old. How long have you been in prison? I've been in prison for 36 years, two months, and 20 days. So how old were you at the time this offense was committed? I was 21, sir. Let's talk a little bit about John Sheehan, 21 years old. Uh, what was your education back then? Uh, high school diploma. Were you working? I was in the United States Air Force. How long had you been in the Air Force? Approximately three years when I was incarcerated, sir. And how did your uh, termination from the Air Force take place? Were you, how were you discharged? I was discharged with a general discharge underneath honorable conditions. Sure. Uh, I failed to recognize the two participants at Louisiana State Penitentiary, would you please give us your name and your relationship for the record? You too. Savar you Sutton. Too. My relationship to John Sheehan is a longtime friend. I just recently was released after 31 years. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Cami Matra. I am president of the Hope Foundation, and I am a longtime friend of John and his wife, Deborah Sheehan. Thank you. I apologize for missing you when I introduced everyone. Okay, thanks. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, uh, how long had you and Ms. Monica Sheehan been married? We were married um, in May 1984, and we were married approximately a year and a half. Tell me how your relationship was with uh, Monica? We had a very turbulent relationship. Um, I was very immature, um, very, what's the right word? I wouldn't think before I would act and do things. And because of my actions and the way that I carried on is the way that uh, we had a turbulent relationship, sir. Alcohol or drugs involved in any way? No, sir. No, sir. When, when, when you say because of your actions, did you have an anger issues? What sort of issues? Uh, yes, sir. I had now that perhaps were your issues back then. I, I had anger issues. I had, say, trouble with relationship issues because of the way that I was raised. And I'm not trying to blame my family. Um, I was raised by my grandparents, which loved me very much. Um, but I never had my father and my mother in my life. Um, my dad was in and out of my life uh, more as a brother. Um, he had actually gone to prison himself. Um, my mother, I did not know her at all until I was 15 years old, sir. Walk me through, if you would, the day of April the 30th of 1986. 
of what happened that day, ultimately that, resulting in the shooting of Monica. Yes, sir. That day, um, Monica and I had come back to Louisiana for a visit. I'd taken leave from the Air Force Base. Um, when we got to my grandmother's house, uh, I ultimately shot and killed my wife, and it was my responsibility that is the reason why we are here today, because of the harmful actions that I took. And I am so sorry and remorseful for the hurt that I've caused my son, my in-laws, and my family and the community. Um, there is nothing that I can do to change that except to over the years, I've tried to become a better human being. How, how did you, what were you doing with a gun on that day? Were y'all arguing? Were y'all fighting? It was more that uh, it was to say spontaneous argument, uh, me being mad, uh, and I took her life. Let's talk about what you've done while you've been in prison. Uh, what are some of the programs that you believe that have helped you the most? I, I, I see you've taken a lot of programs, but let's talk about which ones stand out most in your mind, the ones that uh, perhaps have helped you the most. The ones that's helped me the most is um, experience in God and anger management. The anger management was a lot to process, to understand that every action that we have in our thoughts can have an action that will affect others. And so it's to take that action before you take action and start to correct your thoughts and see the consequences of what you're thinking about. And so that was a big part in helping me change. And if you understand prison, there was a lot of opportunity where something violent could have happened. But because of the action from the anger management, I was able to de-escalate that inside of my mind and say, that's really trivial. It doesn't matter. And walk away and do the right thing. Experiencing God was to me, everything that's taken place and good is because of God. And it's to join him, the thing with experience of God is to see where he's at work. And that's why I went to seminary. That's why I became a missionary going to Raven Correctional Center. Before, when I was growing up and while I was married, it was about putting myself first. And I had to realize that it's not about me. It's about others. And putting others' lives first is what I've tried to dedicate myself to inside of here and be a mentor to others and train them. Let's talk a little bit about your education in faith-based uh, ministries. Uh, what schooling have you had while you've been in prison? I went through all the um, New Orleans Baptist theological faith-based curriculum that was started to begin with. And then New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary came up here and started a extension center where professors come from off the street. I was one of the very first students that was accepted into the program and went through, got my associate's degree and they got my bachelor's degree in 1999. From the school, the reason that I went to school was to be able to equip myself to be able to better serve my community here in the prison. Um, because there are a lot of hurting men and to be able to help them change their lives in what God changed my lives. The seminary gave me the tools. The prison staff gave me the permission to be able to be an inmate minister, go to cell blocks, visit men, sit down in front of there, talk to them, help them see the anger and the things they were doing in prison were not working. And it's because of that Secretary Stoller decided to move us and ask us to volunteer to become missionaries at other prisons because we decreased the violence inside of here and we had hope to men. And so Chaplain Cook, who is Wayne Cook, is the man that came up to interview me and asked me to go to work at Rayburn Correctional Center as a missionary. And it was actually recorded in statistics 
that because of the work we were doing, we could show that the violence and the harm, both inmate on staff and inmate on inmate, went down. Um, whenever you start to show men that you care about them and you're helping them see that the path they were going was destruction, there's a better path. That's what my life is about. And how long did you do your mission? Eight years. And then at the end of the eight years, um, Warden Kane and Judge Hunter and Judge White from New Orleans were wanting to do something about recidivism. They didn't want men coming back to prison. And so they started what is now the Louisiana Workforce Reentry Program. And they brought me back from Rayburn because I had the automotive certifications. And they wanted somebody that had the automotive certifications plus the moral rehabilitation from the seminary to run the schools. And so that's why I came back in 2010 to help take over the automotive school and make that into one of the best programs inside of the state. <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about uh, your transition program. What, what, where will you be if you are, uh, if you get early release? Uh, where will you live? Where will you work? What are your plans? Um, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the parole project. After being incarcerated for 36 years, I believe that I need to go and be with men such as Carrie and others that have got out and adjusted their lives into society. Um, there is things that inherently are actions, waking up in the morning, we're programmed one way. Some of those things gotta be broken um, to adjust to society. Um, and that's where Carrie and him have done such a great job in doing that. From there, um, Mr. Brent LeBlanc that owns Price LeBlanc Toyota has hired me, or I say hired me, he's filled out the paperwork and he's told me as soon as I get through with the parole project to come there and we're gonna work out a game plan for me to come and be a technician with them. And then I'm, from there, I'm going to work there and go to live with my wife, Deborah. Now, you, some of the other programs that you've taken, uh, Victim Awareness, Thinking for a Change. What do you think your actions have done to the family of Monica? The actions that I have caused to the family is something that can't be put into words. The trauma that they've gone through, um, nobody should have to go through. And I realize that when I went through victim awareness, it wasn't just about, say, the direct victim being Monica. It was all the collateral damage that was caused, not just to my son, John, and to my mother-in-law, Marie, to my family by me being incarcerated, to the community that's having to pay for the cost of me being incarcerated. And that's why I've tried to live my life and to become a better human being and do all the things to show that I can become better than what I was. Talk a little bit about your disciplinary record. Uh, you've had three write-ups in 36 years? Yes, sir. The last one was in 2000? Yes, sir. Uh, you have a low risk. Uh, you you. Nothing you can do about this, but you do have opposition, significant, adamant opposition about your release. Yes, sir. You've got, you've got uh, a lot of support in, in your favor as well. Uh, tell me what really, what was the catalyst that, that helped you change from person you were 21 years old with all of those issues to them. That was, I mean, directly my relationship with God, salvation. And I know that might sound kind of corny, but for a person that actually has a relationship with Jesus Christ and knows that he's come into their heart and changed his life, all you can do is start to look into the Bible and find answers to your life. And the answers are there. And so that is from beginning of 
to the end right now, it's that relationship with God that's guided me. And understand that all men should be loved. All women should be loved. And to try to help them understand that's why Christ died for us, because we were sinners and we had problems. And I needed to have somebody that could take care of me and help me become a better person. One last question. What, uh, what is your work now? What do you do now? There? Right now, I'm the lead automotive technician at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. By that, I mean that I am responsible for all the men that are inside of the automotive program, the students and the other mentors that work for me. It is to help them become the best teachers that they can to the mentees that they're teaching. Um, the ASC, which the shirt is I'm wearing, is Automotive Service Excellence. That is the certification that we work to train our students to receive. And we have the highest pass rate in the United States, not just in Louisiana. And that's attributed to the men that work with me. It's also attributed to the students buying in and seeing that they can become better and have a chance to not sell drugs, not rob people, to be able to earn a living, take care of their families. One of my former students now is making over 100,000 a year. Gordon, tell me you can tell us about uh, Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Maribel, uh, just in, in summary, John originally came to us on August of 88. Um, first mention that I can see in his uh, record of a, a Class A trustee was back in 1995. He went to tractor repair, um, NOBTS, uh, as far as the Bible school, his, his education leading up to leaving us somewhere around, it looks like, 02. Um, coming back to us in 10 as an inmate minister, then going into the automotive. Everything that's been asked of John, he's done. Thank you, Warden. I appreciate your comments. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Mr. Wayne Cook, a retired warden, is long gone, and you will be given a chance to make a statement. Ms. Wise, any questions? Uh, Mr. Sheehan, I have no questions, so we're going to start with uh, your supporters. Uh, would Mr. Nicholas Gillery come up to the podium? And you have three minutes to make a statement. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Give us your name and your relationship to the offender. Yes, sir. My name is Nicholas Gillery. I'm the in front. Um, I just want to start by telling you who I am. I grew up in the same community as John. Um, from there, I graduated high school from the United States Marine Corps, I stayed in the Marine Corps, decorated veteran from the Marine Corps, an Iraqi war veteran. Came home, became a state uh, police officer with the Louisiana Department of Law and Fisheries, earned the rank of sergeant, did that for 11 years, and then recruited in 2018 to the United States Secret Service. And I'm currently a special agent for the Secret Service. So last time I was on screen today, I'm here in front of you talking. And the reason I tell you about who I am isn't, you know, for, for, for me. It's actually for that man right there. Because everything I've ever done in my life, he's helped me do. If I needed a major decision, instead of going to college, going to the Marine Corps, instead of, uh, you know, staying in the Marines, coming home, it was a big decision. Big decision leaving after 11 years to go to the United States Secret Service. Every decision ever made, I drew the table, sat down, spoke to that man. Right that man is more of a father. We have the same father, and as you, you heard, what you talked about, he is more of a father than, than anything I've ever had. Even though he was a big boxer, I talked to him once, twice, three times a week. Went to see him <clears throat> twice, three times a month. I'm there at every single little bit. Sitting down, talking with him, he gave me the advice I needed to move on with my life, become the man I am today, and I'm a very successful man today. Um, that's why I tell you who I am. Now let's focus more towards him. He focused his entire life in the penitentiary to help other people. First, he had to help himself, which he's done. Once he helped himself, 
turn it and started helping everybody else. And with automotive program, reentry program, ministry, everything he's ever done is dedicated his life. Mm -hmm. And if he's granted today and he gets out, I'm returning the favor to him. I will be there every step of the way. I will mentor him. It's time to change technology, housing, markets, and individuals, location. That's where I come into play. And I have a nine month old daughter. I want him to be part of her life. That's kind of where we're we're going towards him, you know, as as being there for me. Now it's my turn to be there for him. I really appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. And and um Mr. Gilroy, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Carey Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Um, good morning. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project here uh, to let this board know uh, this morning that John Sheehan is a client of Parole Project. Uh, John has been a client of Parole Project for uh, prior to, through his clemency hearing, through this process. Uh, we believe in John uh, wholeheartedly. 21-year-old uh, John was a taker. Um, today, and for the last few decades, uh, John is a giver, uh, recognizing that, that that's what he needs to do. Uh, he needs to do it for himself. He needs to do it for the people he took from. He needs to do it for the community. We are so happy to be able to bring John into our program, should John get granted today. Uh, not only um, we will help him through his transition uh, after um, nearly 36 years uh, in the world is it's so different from the one he left, um, we know that John will actually be an asset to other other clients in our program. Um, so we just asked this board today. I could I could speak for an hour on John's accomplishments. Uh, it's unnecessary, I think. And in, in today, you've you've heard it. But um, I just asked this board, based on everything you you have seen and heard, um, that you see John is is the man he is today. So much more than the worst thing he ever did. So much more than the man who took. He is a giver, and we just ask this board to grant his parole today. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, we'd like to hear from retired Warden Wayne Cook. Warden Cook? No. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, I uh, I met John about uh, the year 2002. I I went to Rayburn as the chaplain, and John had uh, recently graduated from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary Extension in Angola, and they were going to be sending out some of the inmates as missionaries, and so I got permission from my warden and went over and interviewed John. Was really impressed with him. But also, John had the highest recommendation of any of the other inmate chaplains that were going to different prisons. And so uh, just a couple months later, John came to our prison and uh, he had a, his bachelor's degree. And by the way, I did some research while I was when I became a warden and found out that the recidivism rate for somebody with a bachelor's degree is reduced from 50 percent to about 5 percent. So. There, there seems to be very little risk of John getting out and getting in trouble again. John worked very closely with me for eight years. In fact, he had an office inside of my office and he was a tremendous help. When I went to Raven, I was over both education and chaplains. And we started a number of programs and John was especially of help in the religious programming, both in keeping track of the statistics on the offenders as well as uh, having a really good relationship with our volunteers. Uh, by the time I left, we had about 3,000 volunteers, 3,500 volunteers that came in at least one time every year, some of them every week. And John uh, cultivated those relationships and helped me to start a number of the religious programs that we started. Uh, also, he was instrumental in helping to set up the faith and character-based dorm at uh, Rayburn, and he lived on the dorm and was a great influence. John had a unique ability, and that is he had a great relationship with both offenders as well as the officers. And 
the offenders would often come and ask him for help in different areas. And I was pleased that there was never even a hint that he used that as a hustle to gain money or any other favors. But he also had the respect of the officers and they would often come to John to ask what was going on to avoid any kind of trouble that might be developing in one of the dorms. When Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, the head warden actually made John a temporary trustee. And that's because we had no contact with the outside world. John was able to go into the front of one of the rooms, record the television programs of the news and take that back to the dorm so that they could at least have some information about what was going on, particularly in New Orleans. Um, I was really pleased to be able to work with John. The only uh, difficulty that I had was when he decided finally after eight years to go back to Angola and he had fulfilled his term while at Rayburn. Uh, I, I, I really believe that John is one of the best candidates for a uh, role of, of any of the offenders that I've talked about over the years. Thank you, Arden. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> we're going to uh, ask <coughs> Mr. Timothy Ryan Sr. to come up to the podium. <clears throat> Mr. Ryan, would you please state your name and your connection with this case? My name is Timothy Ryan Sr. I am uh, a friend of the victim, friend of the deceased victim. <clears throat> also, Paul's uh, Parish Sheriff's Office, Chief of Detectives. Uh, been in law enforcement uh, all my life, law enforcement and corrections from AJ Hoover until now. It's the corrections that I'm involved with. Uh, I retired from the state police. I was a homicide investigator, detective, and business. Uh, crime scene investigator, and evidence working at the working group. That's my, uh, my experience. Um, yeah, any other questions? Oh, no, no, just, yeah. just give us your statement. Okay. A um, couple of things. Um, my years of experience in, uh, in dealing with offenders in the correction side and on law enforcement, public safety side. Nothing I want to say here, but I want to offend uh, or uh, insult any of the criminal justice professionals that have spoken before me. Okay. Yes, um, so that's not my intention here. I'll tell you my experience, my experience um, is that uh, I've seen a trend in that period of time to where the victim is not getting justice. The pendulum is swinging and it's swung way away from the victim. And they're not getting any justice. The, uh, the promises made are not being kept when the people decide a case. And it's not been overturned by any court from what I'm saying, it's still saying. It's never been overturned. When the people decided a case and a, and a sentence was made, these victims, and, and they expect that this promise be kept, that my daughter's life is gone, and now his life will be separated from society for the rest of his life without any parole or anything like it was originally intended to be. And the, the victims just aren't getting any justice. And it's uh, it's it's taking away power from people. 
that have decided this case. It's leaving the victim, it's re victimizing the victim all over. You know, they should be able to say, This is done and never harm anyone again. He is going to be punished for life because my daughter's life is taken short, taken away, gone. And uh, it appears to me in listening to him that he's tempted to deceive you as well by telling you that this was just a spontaneous thing that happened and wasn't the fact that it showed that it was a calculated, free, thought out act that he did, okay? Including, including getting insurance policies, forging, forging those, and thinking things out ahead of time. And of course, it'd be much better to commit a crime like this in a rural avoidance parish where training and law enforcement expertise is a lot lower than on an Air Force base with the FBI and everybody would be in on it and be on it like that. So that's that this was a thought out thing. It's obvious to me in the case of the facts of the case. Um, and it appears that he's still trying to deceive you guys into thinking that it's spontaneous. This happened real quickly. So um, an anger thing real quick while she was sitting on the floor playing games. Um, the next thing I'd like to say um, on this is deterrence. The thing that I've learned about deterrence through experience and through my education of uh, associate's degree in criminal justice, one thing that they brought out, brought up a lot, is that deterrence is only effective if these consequences are swift and sure. Now we know due process, things aren't swift in it. Okay. They drag on for a long time. But at least if we make sure the sure part is held, then you still have deterrence. And I think if we look nationwide and in our own state, some of the crimes that are being committed now, the violence is up and growing because there is no consequences, because promises made aren't kept. There's a back door, there's a way. There's a way out of that door on that on on that the public safety. Officer oh, Ryan, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. To go. Okay, all right. Um next thing is uh for a convicted murderer. Um I don't think education is relevant, might be useful over that Angola in, in saving the taxpayers some dollar on, on working on stuff. And this prison ministry might actually save some people like burglars, people that did nonviolent, they didn't murder someone, to help them reintroduce into society and be productive. He, he might be doing a very good job over there and might be very needed over there. And I think it'd be a good place for him because he is a convicted murderer. And there's a difference between killing and murder. And that's what he did. Thank you, that's it, Ryan. Next, we'd like to hear from Ms. Tina Wright. Ms. Ryan, you have three minutes. Would you please introduce yourself and your relationship? My name is Tina Ryan. I was desperate with Monica. Who's actually coming to our wedding in this time? Anyway, I'm one of Monica's best friends. My life changed forever on April 30th, 1986, three days before my wedding. For the past 36 years, I celebrate my anniversary. I'm first apologizing to Monica for not being a better friend. Ask the same question to myself every year. Why did I ask you? Baby, the dreams of having children, raising children as best friends, were also murdered that day. Every milestone that any friendship with an old age could ever be had was murdered that day. 
Our boys are three years apart in age, and to this day, they've never met. The last time they held Monica's baby, he was only an infant. Since her savage murder, my family are my only friends. The reality of Anthony, free from behind bars, is a frightening, ongoing nightmare. Anthony's release would be an every hour nightmare extension to design in a long period, where I still live. The kids have seen him in a grocery store, doctor's office, or on the street is just too far for me to imagine. The slightest thought of this scenario makes me want to vomit. Monica's son and granddaughter have fled the state of Louisiana in fear of Anthony's release. The fear is so great that Monica's son, Anthony's son, is changing his name once again and cannot be here today. I understand Anthony's a minister, supposedly a safety man. As a Christian, I really hope that his truth is all soul. I pray Anthony honors his son's prayer not to be found or seek out his granddaughter. I ask God and you for Anthony's parole to be denied. He may continue to minister and save souls from inside the prison walls of Angola. If parole, I pray the United States Air Force will be awaiting him. Again, a reminder if parole and murders again, blood will be on the hands of the governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Now we hear from Ms. Um, Julia McDowell. Ms. McDowell, just stand up and turn around at your seat and give us an introduction. And we know you will love it. You speak up a little bit the mic and catch My only child, and she was murdered in cold blood, confined to prison, John Anthony Sheehan. And she was murdered in April 30th, 1986, when she was only 19 years old. I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm depressed, I'm furious, I'm devastated, I'm disgusted, and sad that this man who was twice convicted of second degree murder sentenced to life without pardon of parole may possibly be released. Because of all of his many accomplishments and degrees he has obtained while incarcerated for the murder of my child. My daughter got her life taken away from her forever. He took away her chances to ever accomplish anything. She can never accomplish being a mother to her son or a grandmother to her grandchildren. The only certificate she ever got was the death certificate. She got a life sentence forever and can never come back to ask for her life. He not only took her life away, he also took her life away. My grandson's life away forever. But yet he may get his life back because of his accomplishments, no matter that he committed second degree murder, that doesn't count me. Rest of justice. This is the man that blew kisses at me at the trial of my daughter every time I looked up at him. This man and his family has threatened my family and grandson for you, Derek. It doesn't go by John. Derek is only eight years old. I'm lying on the floor next to my daughter when we murdered she mother was shot in cold blood. My late husband and I adopted him and raised him for my daughter, and I considered him my son. The prisoner sent letters to Derek by people outside of the prison, demanding his life, that he married in prison, the one he was cheating on my daughter with before he killed him, the one he brought to the funeral home he was making out with her in a car park right outside the funeral home while my daughter's body lay inside. Letters devastated my son so much to the point that it caused him to have panic attacks and still does to this day. He's 37 years old. In these letters, he told Derek that he didn't know why Derek hated him because he'd never done anything to him. He also told Derek that he knew everything he did and everywhere he went because he was having him followed and the burden was showing him to us. I remember at this time, he was a minister when he wrote these letters to Derek. He had to put Derek in counseling for many years to try to help him deal with this. Derek moved out of Louisiana when we were told about the pardon from the hearing in September 2022 because he did not and does not want she had around him or his family if he gets out. At the pardon board hearing, when asked what his plans were, if he was to get out, she had stated that he had a job at Christ at one time in that movie. Now, all of a sudden, since Derek moved from the state, she has considering changing his residency to that state. 
Derek wants absolutely nothing at all to do with this prison. He and I are both going to take a restraint against him for the three reasons. I'm pleading the court to deny his request to hold him up. I see that in his reasons. I did not be allowed to live over anywhere near, near me or Derek. And he not be allowed to move out of the state. I also request that he wear an ankle monitor for at least half of this supervision. And I ask that he has no contact with me or any of my family, Derek, or any of his family. For justice for my child, to see your child. How would you act? I'm asking for justice for my Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGowan. Mr. Sheehan, would you like to make a brief statement before Mr. Nordyke closes the hearing? Yes, sir. To the board and to all of the citizens, I am deeply remorseful for the actions that caused us to be here today. It's because of my actions 30 something years ago that we are here. And I can never undo that. And I pray for the victims that I have caused and have tried to live a life of humility and repentance for the hurt that I've caused and do everything that I can to become a better human being. I thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Nardais. Thank you, sir. Um, after almost four and a half decades as a trial lawyer, the urge to, to rebut some of the, the conversation is, is overwhelming, but I'm going to resist. And I'm going to try to address solely uh, the attributes that have, that have appeared here today. First, I want to say, at the, at the pardon hearing in this matter, and I know Mr. Mirabella and you, Mr. Roche, will remember, Ms. Wise was not there. One of the other members of the board who uh, was, was inquiring actually sort of spoke rhetorically, and she said, if not you, who? That struck home. And what, what Judge Jackson meant by that is of all of the people that she had sat in judgment of in this, on the pardon board, and on parole, I guess, also, if not John Sheehan, with the accomplishments that he has, with the rehabilitation that he has not just shown but lived, who else who else could possibly be meritorious? Who else could possibly be be there? And I, I want to look at just a couple of things and then I'm going to shut up. It's 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 time for a vote. And that is, let's talk first about remorse. I think John has shown remorse in a very, very dramatic way, in a very good way. I've known John since his Rayburn days. I'm, uh, uh, Warden Cook Warden Cook is very persuasive. He had me driving over there every Saturday for, for a year or two <coughs> teaching courses. And I've, I've known John for a long time because of that. Um, and I've known John in Angola for a long time. What you see is what you get. I've never seen anything but the humble, remorseful John Sheehan. Second. He's got a long-term plan and a short-term plan. He's going to go to the parole project who has a remarkable track record of making people uh, re-enter in a calm, good way without a lot of, a lot of hoopla. And they can do it. They can do it well, and they can do it with John. And finally, he's got a long-term plan with a job at Price Le bon. uh, That says volumes. He's got a job waiting for him, earning a good living before before he ever sets foot out of the front gate. One of the things this this board looks for is how much somebody has given back. And John Sheehan has given back as much, if not more, than anybody. Unless you've been around Angola, it's hard to understand what trust, trustee status means and how much it means. John Sheehan gave it up for eight years to go to Rayburn. He couldn't be a trustee at Rayburn except for that one incident during uh, Katrina. Because of the rules of satellite prisons, he couldn't be a trustee. He gave up that status, those privileges, to go do good works at Rayburn. 
if you know where John lives today, he doesn't live in the trustee dorm. He lives in the mentee dorm, the mentor dorm. He lives with those guys that he is mentoring and those guys that he is teaching. So he is not only teaching them academically and vocationally, he's teaching them morally. He lives, he lives what he talks about. I'm going to ask that John be released on parole. It may be appropriate that uh, that he not be allowed to go into a Voiles parish, and that would certainly be understandable. But I think I think what you see here is a man that is ready to go back into society after 36 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Is the panel ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Mayor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, I'd like to, to thank everyone who has been here today for their input, uh, especially to the family of uh, Monica. Uh, I can't imagine pain and grief that you suffer each time you have to relive the crime that occurred. It was a horrible crime. You lost something that never can be returned. All crimes we see and victims suffer. And that's a factor that we take into account as part of our responsibility in making a determination here. We have a specific role and we have a certain set of duties. Everybody in the criminal justice system has duties. The law enforcement uh, has their obligation and responsibility. The district attorney has their obligation and responsibility. The judge and the jury have their responsibility. And the legislature has a responsibility in setting the ground rules for what we do here. And we have rules and regulations and, and uh, responsibilities that we need to follow. And our responsibility is not only to look at John Sheehan as the 21 year old who committed this horrible crime, but to look at John Sheehan as a 58 year old inmate and what, if anything, he's accomplished while he's been in prison. I did sit on his pardon uh, application. Uh, I've reviewed his record. Uh, I've seen all of the accomplishments he's done. He's classified uh, as a risk. Uh, there's no question. He's, he's uh, made exemplary service to others while he's been in prison. He's taken good programs. He's got an excellent transition program. Uh, his disciplinary record is excellent. Uh, comments from the various wardens uh, is, is all of the, all of the, of the people he has. Uh, the opposition uh, is, is, is clear, and I see it. And, and I, I feel for it. I, I've watched uh, his cousin, Michelle Juno, giving her uh, video statement, uh, and, and, and I will say this, and I've said this on, on more than, than one occasion, if a vote to keep him in prison would in any way bring back Monica, I would vote in a second. But that's impossible. That's not something. Uh, my vote today would be to grant his parole uh, to the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, follow any recommendations they have. I would, I know they do, but I would want to make sure they give him substance abuse evaluation, mental health evaluation, those things. In special condition uh, that he have no contact whatsoever with the family of the victim, in this case, in Eden. That would be my vote, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. <laughs> this is why. <clears throat> this is, um, this is a hard one. Horrible, horrible. I, I can't imagine. I, I'm, I'm the mother of one daughter, so I, I, just, I can't imagine. Um, but I do want you to know that the victims are in the process. You're not the guy. 
you're not the guy, but laws change. The promise was made, but the laws change. If we are, we are a nation of laws. And um, I don't feel like my vote to Grant is giving him anything. He earned it. He earned it long before there was even thought that you could get out. And that's what's meaningful to me. Uh, but I do want to caution you, uh, Mrs. Sheehan, there, there are some things you can't go back and do, and you got to be okay with that in terms of your son. I, I know you created a lot of new sons with your mentoring, and your son may be something that you have to give him space and respect what he wants. And that's, that's, that's probably going to be your, your, uh, your thorn in your side, as Paul had. It may be, I don't know, but, that, but, I will, but you have to accept uh, that you can't. I concur uh, based on the thing that's already been said, uh, but I do order a special condition of electronic monitoring for a period of time being appropriate by probation and parole. And that you cannot leave, you cannot transfer out of state for that period of supervision. And, and of course, no contact with the victims and you don't go anywhere in your boys parish. Uh, that is my vote. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Mrs. Sheehan, this is a very, very difficult for me personally. I am a victim's advocate, and I tend towards being towards the victim. I see the pain, I see the anguish, I see the mental, physical, and emotional effects this crime still has on the mother of a victim. My estimation, you are fully rehabilitated. I don't think you are a dangerous society any longer. As I say many times sitting in this seat, there's three reasons for incarceration. Isolation, because of negative behavior. Rehabilitation and retribution. You have served almost 36, 37 years in your crime by the actions that you exhibited at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Rayburg shows that you are very uh, compassionate about helping others. It takes 37, 36 or 37 years is sufficient. You have proven yourself to be a, a productive uh, member of uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary, and I'm almost sure that you're going to be a productive citizen in the state of Louisiana, in the nation. Therefore, grant <coughs> your early release because I think you fulfill the three reasons for conservation isolation, rehabilitation, and retribution. Now, these conditions I'm going to review should be strictly adhered to. The first condition is that you should have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. If for any reasons, work, church, or any other valid reason, you need to be out after 9 o'clock, you must get that approved by your parole officer before being out after 9 o'clock. You must have no contact 
would any member of the victim's family, include, including this McDowell's grandson, which he calls her son now, any contact with this individual has to be first initiated by the individual and approved by your parole officer. You should make no contact on your own with your son. You are prohibited from entering the boundaries of a borrowed parish. And you should get a mental health, I'm sorry, a substance abuse evaluation. Anything else, Mr. Electronic monitoring for oh, a yeah. of time in the COVID 19. And your parole officer is ordered to get an electronic monitor. And the duration of that monitoring is left up to your parole officer. You understand? No transfer out of state or work to a board's parish. No transfer to out of state. And that goes along with the uh, restriction that you should not. Enter a boss parish and you're never to apply for a out of state transfer unless it's approved by this committee of parole. You understand the conditions? Yes, sir. Mr. So she had you received three votes. You grant your early release. Your early release has been granted. Good luck. Thank you. So, so um, he was granted a commutation of his life sentence on September 27th, and I thought maybe that we would have had the footage, uh, but I can't find it. He, um, I think, what is it? The the mother of the victim had said, or was it the? But he 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 he's still, in my opinion, lying. Um, as one of the victims has stated, he said that it was spontaneous, but. I have the you know the articles here, and um, I'll put it in the description. But he he bought two life insurance policies like two weeks before he killed her, and he forged one of them. Like he forged her signature on one of them, and um, I couldn't find any evidence that he bought life insurance for himself. Like which could have been an argument. It just had a kid, um, her son, his son that 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 disowns him. Um, so in my opinion, even at his parole hearing, he's still being dishonest, which is, he's just still not taking full accountability. And for that reason, um, I think I would have made an exception, frankly. Uh, and yeah, he left the Air Force Base. Um, the shooting happened in his grandma, in, in her grandmother's house with the child at home. Um, and he claimed that he was cleaning a shotgun and it went off by mistake. And he stuck to that for years. He actually got two trials um, because of the appeals uh, were successful. He got two trials and he was found guilty both times. And um, there's actually a lot of information on this case. There's videos of, of him. I can maybe put it, something together and share it um, of him working in a mechanic shop. And it's kind of funny that Randy Meyer is uh, was used as an example as someone, what did he say? Like someone he wants to, and Randy was accused of killing his wife also, although many, many really do believe that he was innocent, including the family of his, of the, of his wife. So a little bit, maybe a little bit different, but really interesting how quickly this whole case ran from the commutation hearing September 27th to the governor signing into this hearing. And I think that's because the governor, governor's leaving soon. So they're pushing it all through. Um, he obviously, like Mr. Roche, I agree with everything that Mr. Roche said. Um, the question really lies in um, if, you know, in, in how you feel about how the court should work if someone takes a life and, and there's so much victim opposition, um, you know, whether you believe that that's enough to keep someone locked in or if you, um, you know, like Mr. Jackson said in a prior hearing that was quoted today, if not you, who? 
which sounds so familiar. I feel like I, I, I had seen that hearing, but maybe I didn't record it. Um, he was dishonest. It wasn't spontaneous. He bought the life insurance policies. And just for that reason, I, I, I don't like it. I love to hear your thoughts.